Welcome. Here in California, we have been sheltering in place for nine weeks, and many of us have been glued to the news. We've been surfing channels, stations, and websites, trying to make sense of who said what, how to process what is factual, and what is important. And today, we have two experts here to help us navigate all of this. Our special guest moderator, Frank Langford, will introduce our special guest speaker, Maria Ressa, shortly. We are so pleased and grateful to both of them for taking a break in their breaking news schedules to spend time with us today. It is 7 a.m. in Manila, midnight in London, and 4 o'clock here in San Francisco. A little bit about Frank Langford, our moderator. He is an award-winning journalist and NPR's London correspondent. He covers the UK, Ireland, and pretty much all of Europe. He arrived in London a week before Brexit and has been running covering that story since. Before that, Frank was based in Shanghai for NPR. We overlapped for a year when I was based there in China too. And it was also during that time when Frank drove a taxi around the city as the driver and for free. And for anyone who knows China, that is not for the faint of heart. He wrote a book about it, The Shanghai Free Taxi. We did a program here in San Francisco at the Commonwealth Club. The video, if you want to check that out, is available on their website. Frank was also based for NPR in Nairobi, East Africa. So between Frank and Maria, we have the whole world covered for you. It's a wonderfully unique opportunity. If you have any questions about anything, this is the time and particularly on the subject of news. Now with us today in the audience, we have our chair, Ken Wilcox, our board members, Jay Shu and Jack McCauley. He is the co-founder of Oculus and he just joined our board this week, welcome. Asia Society has 13 centers around the world and joining us too, we have our chair from the Philippine Center, Doris Ho, as well as our executive director, Joy Lampe. We also have board members from Southern California, representatives from our New York headquarters and our groundbreaker and innovator members. We also have Chuck Ng who heads our young leaders. I'm Margaret Conley, executive director of our Northern California Center. We do want this to be an interactive discussion across time zones. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So let's uh, go ahead and get started. Frank, welcome. Margaret, thanks for having us. I really appreciate you arranging this and thanks to Ken. I used to see Ken a lot in Shanghai uh, a few years back. And thank you to Maria uh, for getting up really early. She has very late nights covering the incredible news that's going on in the Philippines, not just with the coronavirus, but also with the Duterte government. And this is really kind of especially personal for me um, because Maria and I actually have known each other since 1982. We were college classmates. And I want to give you a little bit of sense of her since I've known her for a long time and our paths have crossed uh, in Asia um, and also here in London, but also on, you know, when we've been reporting on big stories uh, in East Asia. Now, I got to tell you, when I knew Maria uh, in college, she was very much in our class scene as a girl most likely to. Dynamic, full of ideas, driven and very well liked. And the kind of person that we all thought would end up on the cover of Time magazine or something like that which she did in 2018. Now, after college in 1986, she went back home to where she'd been born in the Philippines on a Fulbright. And as anyone in journalism can tell you, there's no substitute in this business for timing. That was the same year that people power revolution overthrew the dictator Ferdinand Marcos. And, uh, you know, Maria was very drawn to that and went to work as a journalist. Now, she first started with CNN as the bureau chief in Manila, then on to Jakarta, where we ran into each other covering the, uh, the fall of Suharto in 1998. Um, I remember being actually on an elevator with Maria uh, the day that Suharto had to step down. Now in, 2000, in uh, 2011, she, were, she was back in the Philippines and she co-founded Rappler. And I remember her telling me about this. Her whole idea was to build a smaller lean digital news operation. And it was gonna use the country's rapidly expanding social media networks and eventually they, Pretty quickly, it became one of the country's leading sources of news. Now, after Rodrigo Duterte became president, his government and their allies on social media targeted Rappler and Maria, which was investigating the weaponization of social media and the government's assault on drugs, which left thousands and thousands dead. Now, the government has filed, as many of you probably know, a series of cases against Rappler based on security and tax law, widely seen as trumped up to cripple the news operation. Maria has been arrested multiple times and could eventually face a sizable prison term. In these last couple of years, as you probably know, she's become an international symbol of press freedom and has won more awards for press freedom than, frankly, I've been able to keep track of. 
which makes her a perfect person, I think, today to talk about press freedom in the age of COVID-19. Um, and I, I don't know how closely everyone's been following this because there's so much news, but from a journalistic perspective, one thing we've all been watching is how some authoritarians around the world are using the crisis to actually crack down on press freedom and press their advantage. In some countries right now, politics are pretty frozen. Mass protests, by and large, impossible because of social distancing. And the recession already is making it harder for independent media to operate. Just today, Buzz BuzzFeed UK announced it was gonna shut down here in London. I wanna just mention several examples, some of which you may be familiar with. In Hungary, President Viktor Orban has secured sweeping new powers to punish journalists. In China, as we would all remember, in the beginning of January, before the coronavirus was actually identified, Wuhan police said that they had picked up eight people for spreading untruthful information about uh, cases of pneumonia. Of course, this turned out actually to be uh, the coronavirus. And uh, one wonders how different things might have been uh, if people had been able to get on this sooner. And earlier this month, the reason we really wanted to talk to Maria is uh, the government in the Philippines forced ABS-CBN, the country's biggest TV broadcaster, off the air. She was, of course, head of the news, uh, news at that network. Um, and so I want to now just turn it to Maria for a few comments and then jump into questions. Uh, first, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Asia Society. Thank you all for, a for tuning in. Um, I, I think, you know, I guess I've, I've always said that over the last four years, it has been four years since we've come under attack. What we've seen in the Philippines is death by a thousand cuts of our democracy. And uh, it is still unbelievable to me that I am living through this. I'm like Frank, we're the class of 86, so I'm old. I consider myself, maybe Frank doesn't, but I feel, I feel like I've lived through so much, but nothing compares to this. Every day I feel like Alice in Wonderland and the Mad Hatter is in charge and I have to keep going through the rabbit hole so I can come out the other side. That's me. Let's take it out of me and then just uh, talk about like uh, the not just Philippine democracy, but kind of the global landscape. The Philippines, what's happening to the Philippines has been kind of uh, an example for the rest of the world because it started with information operations with social media platforms that all came out of California, right? Uh, and how they have, for the first time, really put all of the global community on the same communications platform and how information is power. Everything starts from there. I think, you know, Frank, it's like, we've known this. It's part of the reason we became journalists. Information is power. But what happens when that information is manipulated? What happens if you can't tell fact from fiction? What happens if you become the target of exponential attacks? These are all new questions before the virus. And now that we have SARS-CoV-2, the context in the Philippines is, is horrific because not only, essentially we have martial law without being called martial law. Uh, all of the conditions for dealing with the pandemic me meant well, this is our ninth week of lockdown. We have checkpoints, we have curfews. Uh, and then on May 5th, when ABS-CBN, the largest broadcaster, uh, went black for the first time since 1972. Think about this, the last time that happened, it was followed by 21 years of a dictatorship. This is the context that we're talking from. Maria, talk a little bit, explain exactly what happened to ABS-CBN and why the government moved against the network and why now? So let's talk, think about ABS-CBN like uh, CBS, what, whatever is the largest, uh, most popular network in your country. And then all of a sudden, if you're a democratic country, it gets shut down. Um, the reason for it, we, and it, this is, didn't happen all the time. I think the erosion of freedoms in the Philippines began with uh, weaponization of social media, followed by weaponization of the law. So the same thing that happened to me and Rappler is, is what happened to ABS-CBN. They just happened to be significantly larger. Uh, the market cap of ABS-CBN is about 300 million US dollars. About 11,000 workers are affected by this. Um, 
it is, well, here's something very significant. There will also be a business impact of this because since President Duterte took office, since May 2016, ABS-CBN lost 67% of its stock price, right? So what happened? Almost as soon as he took office, he threatened, President Duterte threatened the largest newspaper, the Philippine Daily Inquirer, filed legal cases against the owners. And then within two weeks, the owners said that they would sell it to a businessman friend of President Duterte. That sale still hasn't happened, right? But since then, President Duterte then went on to attack ABS-CBN. That's early on. And he said that he threatened not to renew the franchise. Well, fast forward now, uh, two, three years later, and here we are. The franchise wasn't renewed. Largely, the delay was in Congress. And then after the franchise officially expired, which would have been May 4th, uh, a small regulatory body, the NTC, came in and gave a cease and desist order to ABS-CBN. Uh, within a few hours, they shut down. Uh, it's very similar to what happened to Rappler, a small regulatory agency, the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, tried to shut us down in 2018. So, I mean, in terms of what happened to us, online exponential attacks, 2016, by 2017, the same lies, well, let me put, the same attacks came from President Duterte himself in his State of the Nation address in July of 2017. A week later, we got our first subpoena. January 2018, we got uh, uh, an, an order from the SEC telling us that our license had been revoked. We've been fighting it since January 2018, and that was a year where the government filed 11 cases and investigations against us. In 2019, uh, I had to post bail eight times to be able to stay free. I was arrested twice, detained. Um, I have paid more in bail and bonds than Imelda Marcos, who's been convicted in four different countries, right? So it's, it's a similar tactic of using the law to take away rights that are guaranteed by the Constitution and uh, to add a veneer of legality. So ABS-CBN now is dark. Uh, just yesterday, Congress, the Speaker of the House said that he would not, he did, they didn't want to renew the franchise immediately. What they did is to come up with a provisional franchise, and this is a bill that is now making its way through Congress, uh, extending the franchise until October, five months. That again is a Damocles sword. If that were to go through, okay, abs cbn the largest broadcaster, has a franchise, can operate for five months, right? Then we go through this whole thing all over again. Are they able to broadcast at all, say on Facebook or other platforms? And do they have any legal recourse here? Yes, they can. And the propaganda machine, uh, I call it the propaganda machine. Uh, it is uh, the disinformation networks that are supported by and run by some government officials. Uh, these networks have been in, in full force over the weekend, actually rivals the peak of when they were attacking Rappler in 2016. Uh, it is more vicious, these attacks online. And the narrative that they're pushing out on, on social media is that, well, it's not really a death of press freedom. It is, you know, they're still free to broadcast. This is death by a thousand cuts, right? That's, it doesn't matter if they're free to broadcast. Uh, abs CBN's franchise. It, it's clearly uh, been withheld because of political purposes, but the double speak around it has allowed, uh, has allowed this to happen. Um, what, are, what are their legal recourse? They went and sent, uh, they have filed at the Supreme Court, which is largely dominated now by Duterte appointees. I think there are only three Supreme Court justices who aren't who haven't been appointed by President Duterte. So they filed a, 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 an appeal at the Supreme Court hoping that it would take away the NTC move. Um, but truly, that could take a long time. So aside from uh, the, the Supreme Court itself, we, by the way, along with other journalists and, and, uh, and academics, have filed a case at the Supreme Court that it would be more than a year now. Uh, because we've been banned from coverage at uh, anywhere President Duterte is. And then just yesterday, our reporter was kicked out of a, a chat group that the Philippine National Police has. So these, again, death by a thousand cuts, right? 
well, how do viewers feel? And they must have a large viewership, but are they responding? And is there any role for the public to try to put pressure on the government? I think that's, yes, uh, they are responding. Uh, but again, uh, they're met by a very organized and, uh, and, uh, and large propaganda machine online. Uh, Frank, you know this, but you know, the Philippines, I think this is the fifth year running where the Philippines, the country that spends the most time on social media, we're number one, fifth, five years in a row. This is according to Hootsuite, and we are social. Uh, we're also number one in terms of the amount of time we spend on the internet, even though it's slow, but we spend a lot of time. Number one globally. So Facebook, 100% of Filipinos on the internet, you're talking about 110 million people, more than 70% have internet. So 100% of the people on the internet are on Facebook. So Facebook really is our internet. And as of three years ago, when we did a map of our information ecosystem on Facebook, the center of that, the center that dictates public discourse, that was dominated by the disinformation networks and all of the traditional news groups were pushed to the periphery because we had not collaborated with each other, right? So this is, this is a problem that we've been trying to deal with since 2016. And in your dealings with Facebook, I mean, let me, let me ask you this too. We, I remember we saw each other in reunions a few years ago. And I remember that you were doing a lot of Facebook Lives. You were talking a lot about the value of big data. And you saw Facebook is very, very valuable to rap with. When did you begin to see that change and see that, that Facebook actually could be used to attack you? And then what have your conversations been like with Facebook? And do you see any progress there? Wow. Uh, so I know the best and the worst of what social media platform like Facebook can do, right? I mean, I always say I drank Kool-Aid. Rappler was created for social networks. That was the idea. We wanted to see how information cascades on social networks. And what are social networks? There are family and friends. What social media? There are family and friends on steroids, right? It's, it's, uh, it's extremely empowering and enabling at the beginning for Rappler. Uh, in a year and a half, we became the third top online news site just behind the, the major two television networks in the Philippines. Um, so we were, Rappler couldn't have grown without Facebook. We were essentially alpha partners here in the Philippines. We knew Facebook better than the people who, create, who started Facebook, who came to the Philippines after we were already using it well. Uh, but we were also the first to be attacked and the first to sound the alarm about Facebook's role, about these cheap armies on social media and how they could roll back democracy, not just in the Philippines, but in, in many countries around the world. Our first story on that, on Facebook's algorithms, that was in 2016, right? So, and, what, and the attacks were new. Frank, we talked about this. Imagine in 2016, uh, we just did a story showing how social media was being used to attack narratives they didn't like. And because we did a three-part series on what we started calling the propaganda machine, uh, I received an average of 90, 90 hate messages per hour. And one of the ways we dealt with it was to create a database. We called it the Shark Tank. We worked with Facebook on this to kind of sound the alarm. I don't think they really believed it. <laughs> and that's 2016 until 2018 when Mark Zuckerberg gets called to Congress, right? Uh, so in, in 2016, we saw this. Once that those attacks happened, it wasn't just happening to me. The first targets of the attacks were anyone who questioned the drug war. And that's normal people. Then after that came the journalists, the activists, opposition politicians. Uh, and these attacks are very personal. You know, it, it, when I was with CNN, I could hide behind the network. You know, you didn't have to. The age of social media really stripped journalists and uh, made us vulnerable. And those were some of the appeals I made early on to Facebook. You know, the Constitution guarantees protections for me as a journalist because we challenge power. And these platforms have stripped those protections. And they're like, well, you're a public figure. Uh, 
I think there's a difference between a politician and a journalist, but you know, go figure. Anyway, come 2018, when Mark Zuckerberg gets called to Congress, all of a sudden, everyone is speaking up. Uh, oh, one last point. Uh, our data also showed that women were attacked at least 10 times more than men in 2016. Right? So we have to crunch all this data. We have more than a terabyte going through. Um, how, how do we deal with Facebook today? Well, well, Facebook has done three takedowns in the Philippines, October 2018, January 2019, March 2019. And the policy is CIB, Coordinated Inauthentic Behavior, right? Coordinated and Inauthentic. The Philippines, they have always included us as a footnote in a lot of their, the reports they have to do because this is a country where they were dealing with more than the average of fake accounts. We don't need to rely on bots. Labor is cheap in our country. So fake accounts. So those three, three takedowns were a lot of fake accounts. But then what happens with the good information operations? Remember, this is a military tactic, right? Uh, it's part of the Russian military doctrine, for example. Influence operations or information operations. The first is could be inauthentic. Let's think about it like a virus since this is that time. You introduce the virus, but then at some point that begins to infect everyone, the ecosystem. What happens when they're real people who believe the propaganda? And that's kind of what, what Facebook is dealing with now. And I think they're in the process of trying to come up with new policies. Here's the silver lining. With COVID-19, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, they have begun to take their gatekeeping role seriously, finally, right? They are realizing that lies in this day and age can kill. And so they are taking down content powers that they have never, you know, they've taken a long time to use. Uh, and in these takedowns, people like Bolsonaro of Brazil, of Rudy Giuliani, they've been taken down. Um, and what I hope, is that the journal, we should continue to push Facebook, YouTube, Google, to move it, not just to the disinformation of COVID-19, but to political disinformation. Because these lies, these attacks on journalists, they're debilitating and they have real world impact. I think part of the reason these legal cases have, have flourished. Uh, why people can even believe it in the Philippines is because the social media attacks have acted like fertilizer. They have changed the way people view journalists, Rappler, and me. I want to make sure I understand something because I think you made a really interesting point is that you create all this disinformation and then ordinary people who are not bots, not working for a St. Petersburg troll farm, end up pushing it out as well. And so maybe Facebook doesn't feel comfortable shutting down real people who have been on Facebook since 2008 or something like that. So here's another question. Given that Facebook is being more aggressive now in the era of coronavirus, because it is a life and death situation, information really has a, a, a dramatic impact on people, as we're seeing. As we saw with when President Trump was talking about drinking disinfectant, disinfectant. Um, <laughs> injecting disinfectant, and I believe it was Larry Hogan, the governor of Maryland, was apoplectic because he got hundreds of calls for people asking if they should actually do this. Is there an opportunity in this crisis to push Facebook and other social media platforms even farther so that this now would become the norm? They have resisted it for a long time. And if so, how would you go about doing that? Frank, absolutely. I think that's the silver lining that we have to, we have to expand, right? I, I think that I had always thought at the beginning of the year in January 2020, I, I thought 2020 was the year that we will deal with these, uh, with the, the tech, with technology, finding regulations that could be global. I think that, you know, what we're, of course, then COVID-19 happened, right? How, how do we push this forward? I think because they are dealing with this, the social media platforms are finally realizing the kind of power they have. And if we can equate political disinformation with what they're doing with COVID-19, then they've already opened the door, right? So that's the first. I think the second one is 
we have to look at two things, the design of social media platforms and then the kinds of incentives social media platforms have to actually protect its users. Uh, I'll start with the second one. Right now, social media platforms don't have really any incentive to protect its users because take a look at Facebook in the last quarter when in the quarter where they said that they spent more money for data privacy to protect users, uh, they were pummeled by the market. They lost uh, value. Uh, so how do we align the incentives, the economic incentives with protecting the people that give value to these networks, right? That's one. And then the second part is protecting the public sphere of democracy. Uh, starting in 2017, November 2017, Freedom House came out with the first study that said in at least 27 or 28 countries around the world, these cheap armies were rolling back democracy. The next year, Oxford University's Computational Propaganda Research Project moved that number to 48. And then the year after that, that was last year, that number is at like 79. So democracies around the world are being eroded. Let's go back to the first point. How do you regulate it? This is something that uh, governments all around the world are starting to grapple with. Great Britain was actually one of the first ones to have a global uh, uh, view. Um, Damien Collins's reports have been really great in terms of, of showing the impact globally and how it has been used domestically in each country for more power, right? So if at the beginning it was an enabler for normal people, as governments caught up and figured out how to use it, they had far more resources to throw in. And by 2014, the first example we have is Russian disinformation in the Ukraine, in Crimea, right? So, so from there, uh, all of this has happened. Um, how do we deal with this? What regulation? Uh, there, I think one of the first, actually, I'll shut up because I've been talking a while there. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I know, I, I want to hear. So, I have one idea, and this was something we were percolating. I was talking with Sinan Aral at MIT, who is uh, about to come out with a book. Uh, his book is, oh my gosh, I can't remember the title of it, but this book is interesting because he has both engineering background, policy, and, uh, and he, he said that it is really built into the social networks, this kind of polarization. People will say Eli Paris or filter bubbles aren't real. That's wrong. The filter bubbles are built in, right? Because if you think about it, one decision, uh, which is to grow the networks by using the idea of friends of friends, friends of friends. By using friends of friends to grow that network, you've actually designed polarity into the social media platform. And that's based on the work of a Princeton a, a Princeton study called The Strength of Weak Ties by Mark Granovetter. So think about it like this, in the Philippines, and you can think US or Britain, but in the Philippines, we were all in the center here. And then what happened was, because of the way the design was, if I was pro Duterte, I would move further here because I would do friends of friends. So I wouldn't see as much of this as I would of pro Duterte, that would radicalize me further to here. In the meantime, on the other side, if I'm anti-Duterte, I would be moved further here. Now, think about this as left and right in the US. And instead of actually having a public sphere where we agree on facts, you are now this far apart and the facts are debatable. So that's built into the design. How do you fix that? You know, these are some of the things I think we need to grapple with. In terms of legislation, an easy one is to actually empower the user uh, we create our own data for, for Facebook, for YouTube, for, for Twitter. What if we can own that? And if we don't feel protected, we can leave with our data and move to Jimmy Wales's new platform. So that would kind of get rid of scale issues, right? Because if enough people are unhappy, we can then go to Jimmy Wales's new social media platform and scale that. Right. So there's lots of different things, but this okay. is this. There's a lot of things. I think we need to think about the, the information dystopia, how to fix the information ecosystem. We need to think about this like it was post World War Two, like an atom bomb has gone off and that we need to somehow protect humanity from the worst of what humanity can do. 
that's the kind of emergency mentality we need to have to fix that. And then, of course, what happens with COVID-19, right? It, it's now put that in the back seat. Speaking about the coronavirus, one of the things we've been talking about at, at NPR on the international desk, we are meeting every day, um, which we've never done before, on and able to talk all correspondents around the world. And one of the things we're thinking about is, in the end, whenever the world gets through this, you're going to see, as you already have to some degree, which countries do well and which countries don't. And certainly here in the United Kingdom, it was very difficult when the UK passed Italy to become the highest death rate in all of Europe. And what I'm wondering is, in terms of holding people account, particularly populists who may not be as detail-oriented, perhaps a Duterte, perhaps a Boris Johnson, is there an opportunity, are you seeing an opportunity for journalists and the public to hold some of these, some people with more authoritarian tendencies, more sort of negative right-wing populist tendencies, um, hold them to account? I think in the Philippines, that's precisely what we have to do and we keep trying to hold the line, right? But the problem with this now, of course, is that uh, in a lockdown situation, civic engagement, for example, the shutdown of ABS-CBN. If that had happened during normal times, there would be protests in the streets. ABS-CBN has the Philippines' largest stars, right? Um, so that would have happened and that would be something the government would have to deal with. Without protests, how do you do that? There are some bright spots online. Um, the social media, the disinformation networks of the government didn't quite know what to do when real people came in and began to fight back online. And we saw this on Twitter in on April 1, of all things, April Fools. On April 1, President Duterte gave a, like, a midnight rambling talk where he told the law enforcement, the military and police, that if anyone violated quarantine, that they should, and this is a direct quote, shoot them dead. That night, Filipinos online were outraged. And it, it was the first time we saw a hashtag trend number one in the Philippines and then trend globally that I would have thought would be un unthinkable, which is hashtag aus Duterte now. So that trended. When ABS-CBN shut down, uh, double the number trended to number one. But do these online behaviors, these online protests, do they work? It's unclear right now. It's certainly asymmetric power, right? Because who's out in the streets enforcing our lockdown? It's police in military uniform. You know, having said that, I think, what can we do? I, I think the first step is, is realizing that freedom of the press is the foundation of every other right we have. And if we lose that, then we're definitely not just, we're no longer a democracy, this is like a death knell for me, right? We're now, we now definitely step into authoritarian um, uh, context in the Philippines. Are we moving towards a dictatorship? The seeds are in place. In, in a country like Great Britain and the United States, uh, you guys are, you are still a democracy, but you know, what's interesting to me is that uh, it's the difference between disinformation and misinformation. So something very simple, to be politically correct in the US, people refer to these lies on social media as misinformation. But we know the Mueller report lays it out, that Russian disinformation yes. has Go been, on. yes. So why are we not calling it out, right? We, as in you, why are you not calling it out, right? Why are you not doing something about it. You are being manipulated. And these networks gain more power over time unless the social media platforms deactivate them. Do you think that people will be able to spin the, their way out of big death tolls? Particularly, I'm thinking about populists. Here in the United Kingdom, what we're seeing is fascinating. And I've been watching Prime Minister's questions. There's a new Labour leader, uh, Keir Starmer. He's a former prosecutor. For the last two weeks, he has taken apart Boris Johnson. And it's a very different Boris Johnson in an empty House of Commons who doesn't have people to cheer him on. It's fascinating to watch. And in watching, what's been interesting to watch this labor leader um, is he is bit by bit taking the information, taking the numbers, and basically taking the government apart quite, 
quite effectively. And what I'm wondering is, is there an opportunity for that? And also one of the kind of the conflicts we've seen in this is between expertise, which has been denigrated by populists for the last few years. Michael Gove here, one of the cabinet members uh, said it just before the Brexit vote, we've had enough of experts. Um, and I'm just wondering, do you, is there an opportunity, do you think that expertise is gonna be valued more given that we're in a scientific crisis and the stakes couldn't be higher? Uh Last first, yes, uh, that's a silver lining. We go back to the age of experts because that's that's truly critical. I think the second thing is governments are accountable now. They must, and there's clear impact if they don't act competently, right? There, uh, and this is where I think we can hold them to account. But the to your first question, you know what we've seen in China the questions about the data in the Philippines, because there's conflicting numbers. Well, they just change the numbers, right? Can you do that as easily in democracies like, like yours, like the United States? I, I don't think so. But then again, how reliable are the numbers depending on how many have been tested? Uh, if you look at the Philippines, when we came under lockdown, only 12 Filipinos for every million Filipinos had been tested right? 12. Today, that number is at like, it's 1,722. The total number of tests done in the Philippines for 110 million people is less than 190,000. So do we really know what the disease is doing? Uh, instead of focusing on the security, perhaps the government is just anticipating that they're not going to be able to control the hunger and the, and the virus, so they've moved directly to security. But security should be the last measure. The first one should be focus on the public health emergency, right? And then after that, uh, get food to the people. Those are the other things that the, the curbs. Um, it's been very it's interesting here. Go ahead. What's been really interesting here is there's not much testing in the United Kingdom either, which is one of the reasons things have gone so badly. What there is, though, is data from past years as to what the death rates were. And people are comparing them, and it's, it's become very clear. The number here is maybe officially the government says 32, perhaps 33,000. In fact, it looks like it's well above 50,000 because there are all these excess deaths that can't be accounted for. And that's where the conversation is going. And the government will, I mean, today in the House of Commons, the, the prime minister was asked, how do you, make, how do you account for these excess deaths? 10, 20,000, particularly in nursing homes, been over 20,000 dead, which many of which haven't been accounted for. So that's one way that I'm seeing, particularly in a country which does have strong institutions, does have a strong uh, you know, numbers-based bureaucracy, and an opposition that's beginning to come back. So um, it's been very interesting to watch and it'll be interesting to see how it evolves. Um, I, this has been great. Uh, talking to you, I was wondering what we might be able to do is, if Margaret is interested, uh, maybe going to some questions uh, from the many people who are watching and uh, ask Maria the things that you're most interested in. Sure, we have a bunch of them here, and Frank, jump in anytime. Let's start with some questions on Facebook. Jamie Floor Cruz, that's a name you may recognize as the Asia Bureau Chief from CNN before, and then Hi, Marilyn uh, also has a question, but uh, two questions. Facebook and other social media companies say they are merely neutral platforms, not news media. Now they're beginning to decide or uh, what postings to disallow, you know, to regulate and to censor. Do they have the editorial resources and competence to serve as this? And how should the news industry deal with this? And secondly, a question about Facebook also. Uh, they've now convened an oversight board. Do you think that this is a good thing? Will it help? Uh, so I think the first, Jimmy, hi. <laughs> um, uh, Facebook has been much more than, it is not neutral. It's from its design, uh, engineers have made decisions that have had impact on our societies globally. Uh, journalists have long lost our gatekeeping powers to technology. And when technology, when the gatekeepers abdicate responsibility, the world we live in is the result, right? So uh, Facebook always says, move fast, break things. They broke democracy and they really need to be far more proactive to fix it. Um, 
journalists, what's the role of the journalists there? I, I think they are grappling with this issue because they want to find a one size fits all answers. What they don't want to do is what journalists have always done, which is to make it specific to every country and every culture around the world where they operate in. Look, Jimmy, you and I know this, right? You ran the Beijing Bureau. I ran opening the Jakarta Bureau for CNN took two years because you needed to study the landscape. You needed to understand the culture. You needed to understand the legal issues that were there. You needed to talk to authorities. These companies never had to do that. Now they're, go they're going to have to do this, right? So this is kind of where they pay the piper. The oversight committee is a nice idea, but it does not move at the speed of light, which is what these social media platforms do. How, how fast can they work, right? Think about it. Like just over the weekend, I was dealing with such vicious attacks, hundreds of them in a few hours. Will the oversight committee, will I be able to go to them? It's like, it, it, so I guess part of it is you have to have, you have to draw the distinction between freedom of speech and freedom of reach. That's a quote from Sacha Baron Cohen. It, freedom of speech is not freedom of reach. And what the, we need to hold the social media platforms accountable for is the distribution of lies and how they need to ta take that down because the distribution of lies actually gives them money. Uh, so how do we do that? How do we make them work against make, giving themselves money? Oversight committee, sorry, last one on this is they have some great people there, but they won't be able to work fast enough to deal with all of the lies that are on the platform. I think we need to treat them more like publishers. If Rappler or NPR prints something that is knowably false, we will be sued for it and have to defend and spend money. These companies aren't held accountable for any, hardly anything on their sites. And I think it was a mistake early on, uh, certainly in the United States, legally and otherwise, that they weren't treated more as publishers. They are absolutely publishers. And somebody in the United States Congress, certainly here as well, has to begin to address that if we're gonna get at this. That's a great way to, to actually, you know, make them accountable because I bet you they would take a few weeks or maybe a few months to be able to protect us better. Going back to ABS and CBN um, and Congress, Congress in the Philippines. So why is Rappler a licensee of the SEC and the ABS CBN a franchise? What's the difference and how is Congress involved in granting the franchise? Also from Leslie here, um, the lockdown. How is the lockdown impacting Congress and the Supreme Court from meeting? And is, uh, how are you feeling that on the ground? Hi, Leslie. Uh, so uh, <laughs> the, first, the first part of the question, uh, well, let's take the last part. Congress uh, is doing meetings um, with physical distancing and they're also doing Zoom meetings like us right? Uh, they, they're not moving as fast, but they are in session. Uh, they passed the emergency powers law for President Duterte in 24 hours. They just worked through the night, and that was signed by President Duterte on March 24th. Uh, the first part of the question, remind me again, the first part of the question. Uh, the rap, your, why oh, is rap SEC. Yes. Yes. SEC versus the NTC. Yeah. Uh, ABS-CBN is a television. It's a broadcast. Uh, it's a, it's, it, it travels on the public airwaves. So just like the United States in the past, I think you still have license uh, franchises, right? Uh, every 25 years, every broadcaster who, who uses the public airwaves, television, radio, must get a franchise. Uh, in many countries around the world, they tried to remove this because of course that's political. There's a lot of political haggling. It becomes a political process. Uh, ABS-CBN is particularly, channel two is what it has, right? Which means it's first on the channel in the old analog days, but also first on the channel. So that's a very valued frequency. And uh, that's what other businessmen I think are waiting for. Um, we are an online news site. So look at how much technology has changed the world. We can broadcast. We're broadcasting right now. We can broadcast online, but we don't have to apply for a franchise. Um, and that's a good thing. 
Okay, uh, I have two questions again, and this is about you, Maria. Uh, Leslie asking, when you were arrested the last time, there were huge protests all on TV. And if that happens, how are people gonna know? Uh, is there a plan in place? Is it different now with the lockdown? Uh, what would the media do? And related to that is how are you keeping yourself and your family safe? Those are tougher questions. Leslie, of course you would ask that. I, you know, we have scenarios in place and, and I guess this I don't mind saying. We were, Rattler was well placed for the lockdown because we had all of these different scenarios, including working from home. And so we just triggered one of those. Remember, we've been under attack for four years. Uh, and when your government is the one attacking you, you look at the world very differently. Uh, if, if, the arrests happen today, it's difficult. So what we do is we have a buddy system in Rappler. We check in with each other. Um, I take a page out of terrorists. We have cells, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I better not say that in this, right? Because part of the government's propaganda war this weekend was equating journalists with uh, terrorists, the Communist Party of the Philippines. That's one of the narratives. But if something like this were to happen, I hope it wouldn't be the same. We wouldn't be able to have the same kind of recourse that we would if we weren't in a lockdown, if COVID-19 wasn't there and the dangers increase. But we try to do the best we can with what we have. In terms of my own safety, uh, it's gotten so bad at different points. I, I will say, let me put it this way. Once the lockdown happened, uh, I actually felt an easing of pressure because we weren't the only ones in the crosshair, right? Uh, all of a sudden, the, govern the government had to deal with something else. And, you know, it wasn't just the journalists. It wasn't just Rappler, Maria, or ABS-CBN. It wasn't. So I felt I, I slept. <laughs> you know, that's kind of a great thing. It's been four years. Um, and then the, I think the second thing is that um, we're trying to refigure out what this world looks like. It got so bad at one point that in order to get from one place to another in a car, I, I was wearing a bulletproof vest. And this is something Ramona Diaz, I see, is on the call. And she, she followed us for more than a year, a year and a half. And uh, uh, her film, A Thousand Cuts, <laughs> it takes it from one of those things. A Thousand Cuts is is uh, we were together at sundowns for that so it's 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 unbelievable what a journalist has to go through to stick to the standards and ethics and the mission of journalism but you know what i feel like and this is where i'll equate it to being bullied when you're in school right it's like you do not give the bully what he wants and all you do is you call the bully out every single time Duterte remains very popular in the Philippines. This is a question from Maria, and she has a couple questions here. I'll summarize them. Um, to what extent is this popularity from a sincere belief in him, or is it a product of disinformation? Um, and, and are there parallels with the Philippines and the US? And there was a question here for both Maria and Frank from V2 saying, it seems that we're in parallel worlds, the US and the Philippines. Um, are they feeding on each other? And then Frank, I'll, I'll throw the questions back to you after we get through these. So Maria? Uh, so President Duterte was elected by 16 million voters out of about 54, 50, 54 to 58 million registered voters. Um, and uh, how much of his popularity is real? It's He is definitely, by statistical surveys, they have all shown uh, incredible popularity, far more than President Trump. He was at the 80% popularity rate. Uh, it, while we've been locked down, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, hard to say how that has been, but we have seen the propaganda network push back. How much of that popularity is because of the disinformation? Uh, we know that uh, anyone who questions President Duterte or the war on drugs gets pummeled. So we know narratives are missing from the public sphere because uh, why would you risk the, these attacks, right? So I think, think about this again like influence operations. 
um, at a certain point, it succeeds by changing the minds of people. What is the target of influ influence operations? The undecideds. Right? So if you think about it, even in the case of the United States, you have pro-Trump, you have anti-Trump, and then there are all these people in the middle. Now, what if you have influence operations trying to make these people believe? Uh, in our case, our institutions are so weak that you hear the same lies coming out of uh, public officials' mouths, and that compounds it. Frank, would you like a, a go at the parallels between the Philippines and the U.S.? Well, I think that, you know, what you have in the Philippines, you have to a lesser extent here in the United Kingdom, and certainly in the U.S., are, are populist leaders who also clearly work with disinformation, and they're What's going to be very interesting in the United States is to see how institutions are responding. Certainly, I'm not in the States that much, but I, pay, I, I stay in touch with a lot of people, and uh, there are concerns about institutions, but ultimately, what's it going to look like in the next few months heading into the November election? Um, one thing that's going to be really interesting, I think, there is uh, right now, President Trump has a Rose Garden policy, of course, in which he can broadcast every day, sometimes to his own detriment. At the same time, Joe Biden is at home in Pennsylvania. And I think a real question in the US is gonna to be to see what happens in the next few months. What, I mean, is there really any kind of meaningful campaign? Uh, and does that work to President Trump's advantage or not? But yes, I think that we see when we look at an Orban, we look to a lesser extent at a Boris Johnson, certainly in a Duterte and a Trump, um, you do see similar patterns and similar strategies. I mean, one thing I'd like to ask um, Maria, and this is a giant question, so maybe I shouldn't ask it this late, but I will. You, you know, when we saw each other in 1998 and, and we were following the fall of Suharto in Indonesia, there was a sense then after Marcos and after the way Taiwan and Korea had gone democratic, that the age of the strong man was on the way out. And in fact, we now find ourselves back with fertile ground for strong men. Um, and I just wonder how long you think this might last and what might trigger a swing back to uh, a different kind of a more democratic and more technocratic leadership. Uh, I think about it like the swing of a pendulum and you and I, our careers, you know, when I joined CNN, I started covering the movement of the pendulum from authoritarian one-man rulers to democracy. And that pendulum went, it started with people power revolt in the Philippines in 1986, and then globally, Southeast Asia for sure. And I was privileged to cover that. We were there during the end of nearly 32 years of Suharto's rule, right? And then I think 2016 is the year when because of information ecosystem, uh, because of disillusion with liberal democracy and maybe uh, the, the failure of the trickle down theory to actually trickle down fast enough, this pendulum began to swing this way. And um, our biggest question, so this is where the Philippines is right now and, I'll, and then I'll pull it back out. The Philippines is, this is the tipping point. Uh, we do get, the government we deserve. And it is about people now, civic engagement. If we are quiet and accept this, we voluntarily give up our rights. And we accept that. I think, you know, this is like watching a train wreck in slow motion happen. Filipinos know this. Are we going to, you know, I, I was shocked to hear Filipinos say, it's okay if he's killed because he's a drug addict. How do we say that that's possible, that killing is okay? Anyway, let me throw that aside. So we do, I think this is those, a critical time for the Philippines. For the rest of the world, I think we have to look at the work of, of um, Timothy Snyder. Uh, he's a Yale historian. He wrote a great book called On Tyranny. And we look back, talk about cycles of history, right? He focused a lot on, on what happened in Europe, what happened with Germany, what happened with Russia, you know, what... Uh, how do we, he comes out, this book is a very thin 150 pages long and it, it will give you prescriptive rules how to protect your democracy, right? So giving it, it up voluntarily, giving up our rights, that's one of the things we shouldn't be doing. Frank, I don't know, how do you feel? You're in Great Britain. 
Um, I, what I'm going to be interested to see is if technocratic kind of old fashioned back to basics leadership in places like Germany, Taiwan, South Korea, if those are the people when we get through this in two years, who are going to be the winners and losers? Will the citizens reward people who protected them? Um, will there, this truly prove to be a litmus test in a lot of places? This is different politically. I mean, you are going to have a tally. Now, some people will, governments will do everything they can to cook the books. Um, but that's going to be very interesting. I, have, I mean, I think that the next two years, it's impossible for us to predict how things are going to go. But already, you know, in, in more open democracies, there is a lot of pressure. There is a lot of awareness and there is a way of measuring this. And I think that's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. I mean, there's already been talk here and I know we're talking about, uh, you know, a much more robust um, country in terms of democratic institutions, but there is no doubt there will be an inquiry. Um, people have been calling for it for more than a month. And I have no doubt that that will be a devastating inquiry. Um, and whether President, uh, Prime Minister Johnson can spin his way out of that, <laughs> that will take really remarkable political skills that uh, we'll, we'll just have to see. But I, I think that's one of the things I'm really interested, interested to see, um, is how this plays out and how leadership, particularly populist leadership that's not been so detail-oriented, um, is evaluated. So I think that will depend a lot on what Facebook what social media platforms do, because uh, it is, why are all these countries this so similar? It looks like there's a dictator's playbook. We're seeing it play out in real time. And at the core is information operations. So as Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, as they realize the critical role they're playing at this moment, uh, then we can begin to to go back, right? Go back. There's no going back. But I think the last part is there's this great book by Kath Kathleen Hall Jameson that looks at how social media disinformation seeps into traditional media and then becomes part of the influence operations on every society. She took the 2016 elections and showed how the broadcasters really took these ideas that were seeded on social media and made them mainstream, made them facts. You're way ahead of this than most people because you've been living it for so many years and these waves have hit the Western shores later. At what point would the leaders of these social media platforms recognize that enabling authoritarians who in the long run may shut them down, I mean, look at China, uh, is not in their business interest? I, it's I don't know. Them too long. Yeah, it's taking them too <laughs> you, long right now, right? right? No, because I, I, I have actually been talking to them. Oh, you asked how we were. We're frenemies. We know each other. We work together and we push each other, right? Uh, uh, I think that it's enlightened self-interest to take a page out of ASEAN. Enlightened self-interest. They need to look at what they stand to lose in the medium and long term if they do not act in the short term. Well, Maria, this has been great. Thank you very much for taking your early morning in Manila uh, to chat with us and to chat with uh, Asia Society members and classmates and friends around the world. I, as always, a great conversation, and I look forward to seeing you again in London or wherever. And Margaret, thank you very travel. much for arranging this. I know I can't wait to travel either, but I think it's going to be a little while. Right. And Margaret, thank you so much for arranging this. And thank you, Maria, for being up early. Frank, I know it's uh, closing in on one o'clock there in London. So again, we really appreciate you guys taking breaks from your schedules. I do take away the silver lining. The tech companies are right in our backyard here in the Bay Area, so we need to get through to them. To everyone at home, if you are not part of our Asia Society family, do consider joining us as a member. We have three programs coming up here in Northern California that you may be interested in. On May 20th, Parag Khanna is gonna talk about the impact of COVID-19 on the global economy and supply chains. On June 2nd, we're gonna host a mindful meditation led by one of our Asia 21 young leaders. And on June 10th, Wendy Cutler from our Policy Institute is gonna talk about China trade. Thank you to our team for today's event. Special thanks to Rexel Uwe for organizing this. Thank you again to Maria and to Frank. 
This concludes the public portion of our program. For those of you that are joining our VIP reception, please check your email for the second Zoom meeting link. We're gonna hop over to that right now. So thank you and see you soon.